Hi, welcome back to Roundtable Restoration, everybody. My name is Chris Fisher. We're starting a 1964 Triumph TR4. Editor measurements. The apprentice has decided that he uh, is not interested in learning how to use a micrometer or a dial board gauge and all that other stuff. So uh, he's left it to me to go ahead and measure and mic out the engine, all its components. So I'm going to attempt to do that today. In full disclosure, I worked on this for probably two or three visits. I even had a video ready to post on me epically failing at all of this stuff. And essentially, I'm going to change my focus. I was really concerned about checking everything against the specs and all that kind of stuff. So all I'm going to do is I'm going to go through all of the major measurements that you would take on any motor. And I, most of them anyway, maybe not all in this video, but I'm just, all I'm going to do is the measurements. I'm not going to worry about what the spec is. I'm not going to worry about anything else. I'm just going to take the measurements. I know how to use a micrometer. I know how to use a dial bore gauge. I will briefly show you that kind of stuff, but I'm, this is not a video on how to do that. If you want to uh, figure out how to read or set up a dial bore gauge in a better way than I'm going to show you, there's a lot of videos out there. If I pick some, I'll, I'll put a link in the description or whatever. But we're going to look and try to figure out. I know the engine has had work done on it, so we're going to try to figure out how much and if it's still in spec. So thanks for watching. First thing we're going to concentrate on is the crankshaft, as you can see in front of me here. Three main journal bearings, four obviously because it's a four cylinder connecting rod bearings. I know that this crankshaft has been machined and according to the bearings that were on all of the, uh, all of the bearings were 0.10 or uh, 10 thousandths over. So I expect these all to be about 10 thousandths smaller than what the spec calls for in the book. But again, like I said, I'm not going to concentrate on that. So we're just going to go ahead and use a uh, micrometer. I got a halfway decent micrometer set here. Not great. Not the Mitotoyo or Star or anything. I wasn't going to spend a thousand dollars on micrometers that I was only going to use once. But these do go to ten thousandths, which my old Harbor Freight set did not do. So I'm just going to go ahead and measure all of the journal bearings, all of the connecting rod bearings. I'm going to measure them in two directions, 90 degrees opposed to each other, and just jot all those measurements down like I had mentioned, keeping meticulous records so that I know what I get. So we'll go ahead and get my paperwork prepped and we'll start measuring. I'll show you how I do that. So the first thing I want to do before I use the micrometer is I want to zero it out to make sure that it's going to read zero when it's supposed to read zero. So I have these, um, I don't know what they're, what they're properly called, but these little dies, and this is supposed to be exactly two inches long. Whether or not it is, I don't know, but you essentially stick it in there and get to two inches, and then you can adjust this inner bore here on the micrometer to make sure that it reads two inches when you've got this thing in there properly. So we'll go ahead and see what that get with that. All right, and believe it or not, I don't know how well you can see that, but that's uh, about two inches right now, at least close enough. So we'll go ahead and pull that out. Now these journal bearings run about two and a half inches or so. So I'll get the micrometer out to about two and a half, or at least to get somewhere close. And then essentially I'm going to measure it by running the micrometer up and down the bearing until I get some drag. When you tighten down on the micrometer, this little end, some of them are designed a little bit differently, but this little end is a ratcheting end. And you want to use that as you tighten this down because you don't want to go jamming the micrometer tips into the bearing. And it also prevents you from, from uh, tightening down too much so that your, your measurement's a little bit off here. So you'll, you'll hear the clicks of a ratchet here in a second. There you go. And essentially just up and down, try to keep it as perpendicular to the, the face that you want to measure. And then once you get the measurement, you want to lock it in. There's a little slide lock right here. You just kind of slide that along and that locks it down. So now the trick is how to read these things. And this is what takes some practice. And again, I'll show you how I'm going to read this one in particular, but uh, this like I said, is not the lesson that you probably want to use, but here we go. So this is a two to three inch micrometer. So the smallest it can read is two inches. The largest it can read is three inches. So now each number here that's represented as zero, the one, two, three, four, that's a 10. So right now I'm at two inches because it's a two to three inch micrometer. So the minimum is two. And you can see this four here, so that's four tenths of an inch. So at least 2.4. You don't see the five. The five is still covered. So you know it's going to be less than 2.5 inches. So you're at about 2.4.
And then each individual little tick mark on that same line is represents 25 thousandths. So it's the first tick mark would be 2.425. The next tick mark would be 2.450. So now you don't see a third tick mark. That third tick mark would be 2.475. Each tick mark again is 25 thousandths. So I don't see that yet. So I know I am not 2.475 yet. So I'm in between 2.45 and 2.475. So now I have to look and see what's on the barrel here. So you can see a 15 and a 20 here, and all this is is adding to the 0.5, or the 0.45, I should say, the uh, 0.05 of it. So 2.45, I go to 15, so 2.45 added 15, so 2.465, now I've got 66, 67, 68, so 2.468, and then I'm just in between the other two marks there, just shy of the, the 0 .0005, right, the five ten thousandths. So then what you do to be able to figure that out is you've gotta go up to this scale here, the zero to five scale here, and whichever line here is closest and matches up the, the line that's going across, that's what it is. So right now, if you look at this three line, and drag this three line all the way across, it lines up with this mark right here. The value of this mark on the barrel doesn't matter at all. It's whatever line lines up as close as possible to the line on this scale here, on this stationary portion. So I know it's a three. So now what that's telling me is that's three ten thousandths is my last value. So the fourth decimal place is a three. So again, two to three inch micrometer. So 2.4 and then I had the 50 plus the 68, so 2.4683. So 2.4683. 2.4683 is the value of this bearing in that orientation. So I'm gonna go through, do the rest of the rest of the main journal bearings here, and get all through those and get them all measured up. And I expect them all to be pretty close to that value, but who knows? And then I'm gonna turn it 90 degrees and do all those same measurements again but on back, back, starting back to the beginning, and when I'm all done with that, I'll give you the results. Like I said, this, uh, my explanation there probably wasn't great, but you know, look for a YouTube video that, that makes sense to you, and hopefully you'll, uh, you'll be able to figure it out. All right, so they're all mic'd out, and they look uh, consistent, about uh, point, uh, five thousandths or so on the number three here is, is my five ten thousandths, I should say, five ten thousandths is my major out of roundness, and that's within spec of the workshop manual. But uh, might be a little, uh, a little off elsewhere, but we're gonna go ahead now and do the connecting rod bearings. Same exact way, read the micrometer the same exact way. These things are just, just over two inches, so I'm still gonna use the same exact micrometer. Gonna measure them the same exact way. One thing I will point out right here, you can see this is an oil passage, and essentially there's holes drilled through here to allow the oil to circulate through the inside of the crankshaft. Obviously, that's quite a divot there. You don't want that inter interfering with your measurements, so you just have to either go on either side of it or just offset it just a little bit just so you don't get that screwed up. So we'll go ahead now. We'll check all four connecting rod bearings, same exact way, and we'll see how those turn out. All right, mic'd out the rest of the connecting rod bearings, and I've got the 2.0751 for just about all of them. Uh, number four down here was just a little bit out of round, uh, about four ten thousandths out of round, a little bit bigger. So... The, uh, the looks of this one is it's just fine. The, uh, the machining is still nice and shiny on this puppy, so that's all good. And we'll go ahead and get this wrapped up. I've got uh, little pads here that I'm gonna put around all the bearings just to kind of protect their seating surfaces since they're in pretty nice shape still. And go ahead, wrap it in some saran wrap just so I can protect it from incidental contact and the, and the uh, humidity and all that kind of good stuff. And we'll get that put away and we'll move on to the next thing. So I had mentioned that the crankshaft was board 0 0.010 over your ground right there is the uh, is the marking i didn't notice until just now so i assume that that marking goes with the main journals and then this marking over here 0 0.010 goes to the connecting rods and that tells me that the rest of them have all been done you wouldn't expect them to only do one of them or two of them so now i know for sure next up we got the camshaft so this has a large diameter front bearing 
center bearing, an intermediate bearing, and a rear bearing. This guy right here is the lobe for the fuel pump. And this gear right here is to run the distributor and the oil pump. I had mentioned that I was concerned for one of the lobes. Everything looks good, looks good, looks good until you get to this guy down here. And let me get it in the camera there so you can see that. There's a nick here, another nick over here, and then that big nasty looking mark. However well you can see that, that bag, big nasty looking mark there. So that's not cool, that'll probably have to get some attention. It's even, uh, even on the rest of that lobe. And it looks like there's a little bit of a nick on another one. So probably gonna need a new camshaft, but I am gonna go ahead and measure it out anyway. These obviously are quite a bit smaller than the crankshaft. Same exact method though, using the micrometer and just uh, go ahead and go and measuring all the bearings. Now the front bearing is not in the block. The front bearing is, is removable. That's what this is. So this is also a critical measure on the inside of there. I, uh, I'll need to get that. So I'll go ahead and measure this and then we'll go ahead and measure this guy and this is gonna be a little different. So we'll show you how to do that. Uh, one thing I'll point out here, you can see these like these flattened areas here. Uh, that's that's normal and what that allows you can see these other grooves in there that allows the oil to flow and when it flows into here it can transfer over to the next line and then continue to move around just so oil doesn't get trapped in the bearing and can't go anywhere so that gives like a little relief so that allows oil flow crankshaft is measured out even though i said i wasn't going to be concentrating on specs the uh, all the bearings are in spec for the outer diameter of all of them so that's good here but now we've got to measure the inner diameter of this guy right here. Another thing is the rest of the bearings are in the block. I think TR6 motors, the um, early Triumph Spitfire motors like I have in, uh, in my Spitfire do not have camshaft bearings in the block. It's just a solid block. This motor does have camshaft bearings in the block, which I'll have to eventually measure. That's something I'll have to concern myself with. I, I haven't quite figured out how I'm gonna do that completely and feel confident in it yet because the bearings are in there. So anyway, we'll go ahead and we'll measure the inner diameter of this and I'll show you how to do that. Front bearing here, and what I'm gonna to use to measure that is a telescoping bore gauge. So this guy right here, spring-loaded in the center here. So those two will, will obviously compress themselves and then you've got a little twist lock down here. And when you twist that and tighten it up, these don't move, well, they shouldn't move. That one moved a little bit on me. And then when you pop it back out, you know, loosen it up, it'll pop back out. Obviously there's, there's, no, there's no reading on this. So what you do is you stick this on the bore that you wanna measure, get the springs compressed. You wanna to try to get the center portion centered up, you like this centered up in between just to, so you don't uh, screw up your reading. Get it in there, get it situated. You can rock it back and forth a little bit to make sure you're actually in the center. These are uh, curved on the edges here so you don't mess anything up and, and you don't lose uh, lose contact and when you do you can kind of feel it and then get that in the center of the board where you want it tighten that down you pull it out then you take it and you measure the distance of here with a micrometer so no different than at that point than measuring an outer diameter of any other bearing there is another method you can use a dial bore gauge indicating gauge which i have and which i'll use for my cylinders and I'll explain to you why I'm using that for those and using this for this in this particular application and, and the advantages and disadvantages of each. So we'll go ahead, loosen these up again, compress the springs, get it down in that, in that bore, rock it back and forth a little bit. Make sure it's as perpendicular as I can get. Tighten that guy down. And then after I tighten it, I also wanna check it to make sure it still feels like I'm good. Now it feels like I got a little small. All right, so that feels good. So now take your micrometer and you're setting the micrometer up to it. Sometimes this is easier with a, with a vise or something like that. Two hands, it gets a little tricky. All right, pretty sure I got that. Now what the, the concern here is for these is this is obviously a spring inside this telescoping board gauge. So if you gronk down too much on the micrometer, you'll start to compress that spring. You don't want that to happen. So let's see, I've got, uh, we'll see what I got here just about 1.8750 exactly, which happens to be right down the spec. Spec is uh, 1.8748 to 1.8757. So I'm about uh, 
just shy of 1.875. I'd go with 1.44. One point eight seven four, <coughs> excuse me, four nine. So that's good. So that's that direction. Go ahead and feel it in the other direction. Get it tight. Measure it up, and the same reading. So that's good. So this bearing is good. So we'll go ahead get this all packed up now and get this wrapped up and nice and pretty and protected, get that put away, and we'll move on to the next one. So next up here, I got the pistons. Now the pistons are tapered, so you have a slightly smaller diameter at the top where the rings are than you do at the bottom. These are oversized Molly pistons, 87 millimeter or so, or 0 .040 inches oversized from original, which was 86 millimeters. So I'm just gonna go ahead and measure these out, just like I did using the three to four inch micrometer. Same exact method as I did for the crankshaft. We'll go ahead and we'll do a zero and a 90 degree at the top, zero and a 90 degree at the bottom, and see if it's out around or whatever, and then we'll move on the connecting rod. So same thing, I'm not gonna bore you with watching. All right, so with the pistons, you got the connecting rod that's gonna connect through here through the wrist pin. So as that comes up in the cylinder, up and down, well, it's not gonna be perfectly up and down, right? It's gonna lean to the side as it comes up and goes down like this, and it's just gonna wanna rock inside of that piston a little bit. So where you'll develop your add around potentially is the force is gonna be exerted this way and this way, and you can essentially get this thing to be oblong. So on the top, I've got it perfectly round, but as I get towards the bottom, I'm about a hundredth off uh, out around down here. So I'm gonna go through and, and test the other ones and measure them out as I go. I don't think that's that big of a deal but uh, just of note there, this is number two piston for what it's worth. I was able to find piston rings. Hastings makes piston rings. So that's good because one, I broke an oil ring and two, they're not all, excuse me, not all in that great a shape. So, but next up, the connecting rod. The connecting rod, I'm going to measure the same exact way that I measured the inner diameter of the bearing for the camshaft. Again, just uh, in here at two different points. This guy's too small, I think. Yeah, that guy's a little too small, so I'm gonna have to use a bigger one, but the uh, same process. One thing to mention about the connecting rod bearings, much like any of the bearings that you're gonna put together, is you do wanna torque these bolts down to whatever the spec is, so that you get this thing, just as it's gonna be inside the motor, because obviously that's when the clearances matter. So these have all been torqued down here as I go through this, and we'll measure them out. Again, using the, uh, the inner bore gauge here, and We'll go ahead and get it measured and then measure this with the micrometer. All right, got number two piston and connecting rod all measured up. Connecting rod looks good. Again, the pistons, I don't really know. I have to uh, see if I can figure out the spec and, and convert it to millimeters or whatever. So that'll be a, a little project here coming up. But I'm just going to go through, do the rest of the pistons, and then move on to the cylinders. That's where I'll use the dial bore gauge. All right, so as mentioned, as an alternative to that telescoping bore uh, gauge, you can use this dial bore indicator. And essentially, the advantage of this is once you get it set, you can do repeat measurements without having to measure anything every time. Unlike the bore gauge where you had to take it out, get the springs to compress, tighten them down, take it out, micrometer it, take it out, loosen it up, right, and do that repetition thing. With this, once you get it set, it's good to go for as many readings as you need to take. So things like the cylinder bores where I'm going to do three measurements at depth in 90 degree increments, so a total of six measurements for each cylinder bore, and I get them all set up with four different cylinders, all right, that's 24 measurements, I can just use this and set it up once, and I can figure out the deviation from whatever I set it to. So I'll show you how that's done briefly, and we'll explain how this thing works, and I'll show you. So the trick to this is you need to get a known diameter, and then use the anvils and there's shims and there's different things that you can make. That this is the diameter that you're gonna be testing. So what I did is I set this micrometer up to 3.4500 inches. And now I've got in here an anvil of 3.4 and a shim of 0.05. So this is 3.4500 inches. So I stick it in the micrometer and get it to compress it just a tad. And when I compress it just a tad, you can adjust the zero 
of this gauge face and I'll make it so that when this thing reads zero, this is exactly at 3.450 inches. The gauge here, the reason it's not reading zero right now is because I've got the gauge physically pressed into the system or into the shaft here and that causes it to offset a little bit. So I'm compensating for that fact. So again, get a known diameter that you wanna measure, get that set in your micrometer, get your anvil and your shim selection so that you're close to that, but a little bit smaller, and then stick this, or a little bit larger, excuse me, then stick this in that measurement device, zero out your gauge, and now you know that this is, when this gauge reads zero, you know that this is 3.4500 inches exactly. Now, what you can do is go to the measurement device that you're gonna do, and then the way it reads that deviation from that zero mark, that tells me how much off I am, and then I can do a little, basic, little piece of quick math and figure out what the actual diameter of the system or the, the, the piece of equipment that I'm measuring. So we'll go over to the cylinder and I'll try to show you how that works. All right, well, it sucks when you forget to hit the record button, and it sucks even more when you don't figure that out until you get all the way home and you're in the editing phase. But through the magic of that editing, I'm able to recreate the events here. So I had just shown you where I set the bore gauge up on the uh, on the bench with the dial mic or the yep the micrometer. So now I know when this thing reads zero on the gauge here that I'm at 3.45 inches. So there's there's two ways to approach the dial bore gauge. One, if I knew what the spec was for this cylinder, I could have set the dial bore gauge to read exactly that spec and then gone to do my measurement. But since I don't know that, what I'm doing now is I'm just picking a number that I think about should be this spec, you know, 87, 88 millimeters, something like that, and then converting it to inches, and then setting the bore gauge at that, and then measuring it. What the bore gauge measures is deviation in 10 thousandths, five ten thousandths increments, specifically for this one, but it measures the deviation from whatever you've set the distance in here with the anvil and the spacers and anything else that you put in there. So because I've set this at 3.4 inches, when I put this in there, if it reads exactly zero, that means that this cylinder would be exactly 3.4 inches. Any deviation from that, if it's bigger, it's going to not deflect as much on its way to going to zero. If it's smaller than that, it's gonna deflect and go all the way around past the zero. So as long as it's past the zero, I subtract that number from the 3.45, and that'll tell me what the diameter of this cylinder is. So we'll go ahead, and I'll try to get it on camera here so that you can see. I'm gonna focus on the dial. For the cylinder, I'm gonna measure three spots in two different locations, top, middle, and bottom. The top I am gonna do below the ridge that I feel on the cylinder. It's not really a ridge here, it's more of a, just a, it's not really a ridge, I can't catch my fingernail on it, but I can definitely feel the top of the cylinder or the piston travel. But anyway, just below that line, and then somewhere in the middle, and then somewhere towards the end, but still within the travel of the piston. I'm not gonna measure way, way down here at the very bottom because the piston never goes down there, and that, that measurement really isn't that important to me. So again, when I stick it in there, I'm gonna, I'm gonna measure or focus up on the gauge itself and hopefully be able to see it deflect. All right, so as I stick this in here, right below that line, and you can see that it's running over the zero. So remember the zero is 3.45. So in this case, I've gone over that. So I'm scrunching, I'm collapsing the gauge itself. So this is telling me that it's smaller than 3.45. And how much it's smaller is the deviation here. So I'm going from zero and I'm reading around this way. So if I rock back and forth, it uh, looks like it's topping out right about 23 and a half thousandths. Yeah, give or take. And then you go down to about the middle. I'll try to follow it with the camera here. And that one's about uh, 24, it looks like it's maxing out at. And then far down as I can go without getting outside of the cylinder travel, I'll scroll down a little bit. All right, and that looks like it's about 23 and a half, maybe on its way to 24. All right, rotate it 90 degrees. Start at the bottom. All 
And that one's about 23 to the middle ish. About 23 and a half again, and then towards the top. And about 23 and a half again. All right, so now that I have all those values, what I'll be able to do is do some quick little math and subtract out those values from the 3.4, in other words, so that I can get an actual measurement, and I'll come up with whatever that math works out to be, 3.42, 3.43, whatever it comes out to be. So I know that that's the measurement of this one, and I'll do all of the pistons that way, or all the cylinders, I should say, that way. That's how you use that. All right, so one more warm, fuzzy thing that I'm gonna do here with the cylinder, and to get a good feeling that the diameter is good, is like I had mentioned, I got new piston rings, Hastings, Hastings piston rings. So they say Triumph 86 millimeter, but these are .04 over. So they are, they are corrected, and you kind of see that part number. It's got the big .040 there. But anyway, at that little corner right there, you probably can't see it on camera, but there's a little dot. That way I know that's up for the piston ring. And there's also a little chamfer in here, a little bevel. When I took these rings out, the original rings that came with it, that bevel was up there on top. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna put the piston ring inside the cylinder, and then the gap that's in between the edges of the piston ring right there, there's a spec for that, and the spec is 0 .010 inches to 0 .015 inches. So it can't be any bigger than 0 .015. So we'll go ahead and we'll stick this piston ring in here. All right, and a little trick you can do so that the piston ring is level and, and flat as possible is you take your piston and you push down on the cylinder and you try to keep that as level as you can. All right, and then if you, I'll turn it over so you can see better. In the very bottom there, you probably can see that gap. It's in the very bottom right here. So that gap, it can't be any greater than 0.015. So we'll get our 0.015, and you just run that feeler gauge through that gap, and it ain't going, so 0.015 ain't working. Try 0.013, say we'll skip a little bit. All right, 0.015 is probably a little bit loose. So 0.014, 0.014 feels like it's the winner. Yep, 0.015, so 0.014 inches. So now I know that on a four hundredths over piston ring that's brand spanking new, I got a sat piston ring gap inside of this cylinder. So that further gives me a warm fuzzy that this, pist that this cylinder is probably gonna be just fine. Now I can push this ring several places down, right, and kind of do it like I just did with the bore gauge to um, spin it and do all that stuff, I can get a, uh, a good feeling across this whole thing using just the piston ring, but I don't intend to do that. So I'm pretty confident that all my measurements have come out fine with these uh, the cylinders here. So I'm going to uh, button it up for the day and I'll be back in a sec. All right, everybody, that's all I got. Thanks so much for watching. Leave a comment below, tell me what you think. Well, it's still a day later. Uh, I checked all my numbers and everything like that against the specs, the, the crankshaft, Seems to have been just a tad over machined, but I'm within like five thousandths, or excuse me, five ten thousandths of the spec, and they're all consistently that way, so I'm not real concerned about that. Everything else is coming in just fine. Again, the pistons and the cylinders, I don't, uh, I, I got to concentrate on that a little bit more and ask around of what that general agreement should be, but, uh, but everything looks good, so. We'll, uh, again, got to take care of that camshaft. We'll cross that bridge when we come to it, and I still have to do, the, uh, the main caps and the, and the camshaft bearings, I gotta figure out how I wanna do that and uh, also use some plastic gauge, which I'll show you at some future date. So thanks again, have a good rest of your day. Cheers.